Welcome to the Athletic Football Show. I'm Robert Mays. Joining me today is my good friend Nate Tice. Nate, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing very well. I think anyone watching these streams on YouTube will now see some Christmas gifts in, in the video, usually what I'm wearing. So if you can't see, I have a new what, new sweatshirt on. I think that's what you'll see. You'll see my my outfit updates uh, leading up to, you know, of course, the Super Bowl. Got to have some change, some new outfits ready for that. But I, I'm doing very well. Our video game discussion the other day, like made me download a game on my Switch, which was Batman Arkham City. And it has been a delight. I've been oh, doing so that. so glad. Yeah, so thank you. Inspired. I'm playing like a 12 year old game. It's like a port on the Switch. The graphics aren't great, but I'm having fun. It's a nice, it's a nice venture for me in my mid 30s. But I'm doing very well. How are you doing today, Robert? I'm doing well. It's the end of the year. I'm trying to get in some movies before the end of the year oh. to to work on my. I always do a list of my 10 favorite movies. I've done it for like a decade, and I had a couple that recently came out that I needed to cruise through. So I've been watching like a movie a night with my wife. It's been nice. delightful. We will be doing a live stream tonight after Jets Brown. So no movie tonight unless I decide to queue one up at like 11 p.m. We were going to go out. We were going to go out tonight. There's a bunch of DJs slash musical acts at this venue in Chicago. It's kind of like a New Year's Eve week thing. And it's all ones we love. And it started like two days ago and it's going all the way through the weekend. And we weren't going to go to any of them. And so there was a world where I was going to go out tonight after we finished the stream. Oh, that's And my wife this morning was like, absolutely not. She's like, yeah. I, I, there's, I've, I've been thinking about it for a day. There's no way we can do it. So maybe I'll watch a movie afterward tonight. But for the most part, I've been cruising through them. We watched Holdovers this week, which was great. Oh, did you like that? Uh, yeah, uh, we really, gonna, I really liked it. Queue. It's cute. I would say that's I absolutely in, loved that's it. It's in the hole. It's not on deck. It's not, you yeah, know, it's in the hole about when we're going to watch it. But yeah, I want to watch that one. I absolutely loved it. I've seen a movie in the theater the last two weekends. We're going to go see American Fiction tomorrow. I'm yeah. going to go see Ferrari on Saturday. Yeah. So that's that's what my weekend is shaping up to be, which it always is at this time of year because there's so much good stuff that's, that's out. So much. Yeah, I know. I can't wait. I, I've seen some fun trailers over the future months. Civil War looks interesting oh yeah uh, the, yeah so i just i like alex garland man i'll see any of the yeah, oh, yeah. movies oh yeah i had a uh 28 days later reference wait he directed 20 days later or he wrote it i think you wrote 28 he days wrote later. it yeah yes. he wrote it i actually had a 28 days later reference in my mock draft because i compared <laughs> drake may's aggressiveness to the rage virus that infected the monkeys yeah deep cut deep cut that's how you pull him in there uh, as a writer yeah today was a mock draft day for me too so that was a lot of fun it was i saw you deal i thought you're dealing with the fallout on social Bob media and which Bob is always part of the mock know, draft experience i didn't know chargers fans had that in them I, I didn't know. I, I'm proud of you guys. You guys have some more more anger to you than I realized. So I, was, I think I'm it's been a happy. long year. I think it's been a long stretch for those guys. So there's a and lot of pent up frustration. Oh, and they were just not happy about that. But I, I will say, I will say this about my mock drafts is I put a lot of thought to these. So if you're going to come arguing with me, I will have points like that. I do not do this willy nilly. So yeah. So I, if you want to come and have some, some discussions about it, I'm, I'm gladly, I will gladly do it. But do not compare Drake May to Mitch Trubisky. Just just please refrain from doing that. I would not engage with those discussions. I uh, am just putting all of that aside for right now. Emotionally, <laughs> logically, all of that. So my, we're going to see. I'll probably see a movie on Saturday afternoon, and it will be okay. a double header with a game on Saturday night that I am very excited about. And that, I mean, we'll watch all the games, but this is the big one on Saturday night. Lions at Cowboys. And we mentioned this in our Week 16 recap. And I think the idea being that the Lions were maybe a little bit closer to the NFC elite than we might have thought both before the season and as recently as a month ago. And this is their chance to show it. They've had some really good performances against the Broncos. They played great on offense against a very good Vikings defense or Vikings defense that's given a lot of people trouble this year. Now they get to play one of those NFC elite teams. And this is a great measuring stick game for Detroit right before we get to the postseason. And a great measuring stick for where these defenses stand uh, yeah. on both sides, which is one we kind of expected with the Lions defense, but they, they had some moments there this year and they've had some moments. They've, they've come along a little bit, but on the other side, the Cowboys defense, which we both had as our number one preseason defense and played like that for most of the years, you know, some injuries have happened, are just looking very mortal right now which is something that even a couple of weeks ago did not i did not think was going to be a thing i think they had found answers of course they played some tough offenses but guess who they're about to play an extremely tough offense and i think that's and an offense that i don't think matches up well with them at all oh, no wait wait wait. you mean like the the cowboys match up poorly i don't think the matchups i don't think the cowboys match up well with the lions offense at all i do not either that's i know we're going to talk about it, but i do not either i think the lions have a lot of natural answers to this cowboys defense and i'm I was kind of grasping at straws of what I think the Cowboys could do. 
that's my biggest question about this is that this Cowboys defense that's reeling a little bit, can they right the ship on the eve of the postseason here? Over the last four weeks, and we alluded to this a little bit on the recap show, but I was looking into the numbers even further, the Cowboys have the worst defensive success rate in the NFL over the last four weeks. They've played good offenses. Yep. They played the Bills, they played the Dolphins, they but this is they, they're about to play another one. And guess what? When you get to the playoffs, you're gonna be who, playing against good offenses. We're the offensives in the NFC right now. Think of them, just Rams. Or a yeah. wild card team? Okay, that that's not a lot of fun. I mean, even the Bucks have firepower now. Like, I mean, just these other teams. Not even we're talking about the Eagles or the 49ers or the Lions, like we're talking about right now. So the Cowboys have fallen out of the top ten in weighted defensive DVOA, and they're dead last in success rate over the last four weeks. They are heading in the wrong direction, and this Lions offense has found life. And even if you dig a little bit further into it. I was wondering how the Dolphins were going to run the ball against Dallas. And it was fine. They didn't run the ball all over them. But the Dolphins run game isn't necessarily set up to attack this Cowboys run defense in the way that some of these power running teams are. What are the Lions? That's exactly what the Lions are. The Lions want to get into 12 personnel on early downs and they want to grind you into yes. dust. And I just don't know what Damone Clark and Marquis Spell and this front is going to look like against that approach from Detroit. So I'm concerned that this could be just the continuation of this downslide yeah. that we've seen from Dallas. This could be one of those frustrating games for Cowboys fans where it's just, it's just like those six yard gains, eight yard gains, four yard gains. Just there's Montgomery, there's Gibbs popping one off. You have a team that's struggling to tackle up front right now. You have linebackers going every which way. They they have moments in coverage, especially Bell does, um, but they're light and you're going against up. He's he's 210. He better have yeah. some moments in coverage but, at linebacker. But, uh, exactly right. But Clark has kind of just been so up and down in both phases and his eyes are going everywhere. And now you're going against an offense that will sometimes just run straight zone runs, but then sometimes we'll use misdirection. They run everything. And now yeah. that's a positive this year because they're just good. Uh, and these running backs are just making it just look fantastic. But it's they have just such natural answers. And on top of it, they have personnel groupings. You mentioned the 12 personnel. They can get into jumbo, which is just six offensive linemen. And the Cowboys, only the Bills have really done that to the Cowboys this year, and they had some success. And the Lions use it on the six most amount of snaps in the NFL this year. They have a rushing success rate of 50% on those snaps. So get ready for Dan Skipper. That's the Which would be the highest player. rate in the league. I think the Eagles have the number Easy. one at like 44% right now. Anything over 45% is ridiculously elite. So 50% is just on a good sample size too. Like this is like, like two games-ish worth of sample size over kind of a total of a season. And one other area that the Dolphins really hurt the Cowboys in, and I think, again, aligns with the strengths and the desires of this Lions offense. They want to use play action and just hammer you on those inbreakers. breakers Dolphins were, had a ton of success doing it because those linebackers, their heads are spinning. They're worried about defending the run right now. And if you're going to make them think about that and then have to defend the pass and robot back and all those things, they're really struggling. Cowboys right now are 25th on defense and EPA per drop back against play action this year. The Lions are fifth on offense. Not surprising at all. No. The Dolphins last week, I think, were eight of 10 for like 110 yards off play action. And you could see it. You could feel the yeah. impact those plays were having. So I just think there are so many strengths of the Lions offense that match up with the weaknesses of the Cowboys defense. One thing, saying, talking about searching for answers. The Lions, when you play man and blitz them this year, which I know is a specific band here, but stick with me. If you play man and blitz them this year, they're 13th in EPA per drop back. They become a mortal offense. When you blitz Goff and you give him answers yes. against zone, he's found those pockets. But if you're going to really force the issue, and that's what playing man coverage and blitzing is, mm -hmm. you can force him to make some tight window throws that he's capable of making. But to me, it's the worst version of this Cow Lions passing game. So that yeah. would be the approach. And that lines up with the way the Cowboys want to play, especially on third down. So I think the Lions avoiding third down at all costs to get out of those situations situations is where this game is probably going to be won or lost on that side of the ball yeah and i, I think a mix uh, it they really can't be static and are not so much static but predictable i mean i that bills game just sticks in my head to how this cowboys defense looked and they're just like we're going to line up a man coverage and you're going to know exactly what we're going to run and you're going to get the lions team that does great indicators goff knows what mm -hmm. he's doing he's a great driver of this offense and really just like the matchup issues though it's like if I think Ben Johnson's very smart, that's why he's the top coordinator right now, top candidate to be a head coach, is he's going to know matchups. So Gibbs, like the Lions have a lot of speed on offense. Jamison Williams, Gibbs, Laporta, St. Brown is more of a tank, but he, you know he can really win against man coverage as well. But 
okay, so one of these guys is going to pop. You're going to have a linebacker and man coverage against one of these, against Laporta or Gibbs. Like one of those guys is going to pop. So I think it's just, it's, I think the Cowboys are going to have to kind of eat their vegetables and really be basic and very much co- a zone coveragey. And I know you just referred to some of that with some of the man stuff. They have the blitz kind of off and on. I think the Eagles game mm-hmm. was a good game when they did that third and third and long, they blitz them like crazy. Other downs, they kind of mixed it up. So I think just have to be some unpredictableness. Usually they do that with man coverage, but I really actually think like some of the zone, some drop eight, if they ever, ever want to do that, because that's something Goff can be pretty bad at because sometimes he won't push the ball against those because some of the lanes are getting flooded. So I think you have to mix it up. They have to do it because I just think the run game is going to be hard to find an answer. But I think the pass game, you have to make it chaotic. And by being chaotic, you have to make it kind of unpredictable. <laughs> well, that's I, I think the chaos has to come from what they're doing to disrupt the quarterback. And if they're not yeah. going to blitz, they need those guys up front to win. And that is not something that's been consistently uh-huh. happening. The Dolphins game is a really good example. Obviously, Miami gets the ball out very quickly. But think back to specifically that one deep shot they took Jalen Waddle, where they're doubling Mark. Mike Parsons, no one else wins their one-on-one, and they're able to take a shot down the field. Yeah. That's what this is going to be. If Micah Parsons can't take over this game, the other Cowboys pass rushers need to win some of those matchups. And against this Lions offensive line, that's no guarantee. Right. And this is a very so, good group that has been playing very well when Ragnow is in the lineup. Right. And I, I think like, okay, you want to put Micah Parsons on the weak matchup. So imagine third down, third and four, third and five, something like that. Okay, it's one of these kind of down distances. Okay, Micah Parsons is on the left or the right guard okay that's a matchup we can win there all right he's gonna kind of go over, thank you he's gonna go over i was just kind of going the non one <laughs> the, the fifth beetle uh and so it kind of sorry glasgow but um but okay parsons is over him he's gonna go his ears are pinned back he's gonna do something crazy he kind of usually has a two-way go you know who likes to run the ball on third and mediums as a changeup? the lions remember the chargers game Chargers getting all these funky looks. The Lions said, okay, we're going to pound it down. Fourth and five, I think one was, or fourth and six. They ran the ball with a smile on their face and got it. And so that's another thing. It's like they're going to have those change-ups. And again, it's just hard answers for this Cowboys defense. But if they can answer it, it's like, wow, okay. That'll be that'll be an impressive if we're talking about it. It will be. Show. And it will be yeah. a, a point for them as we think about what type of team they're going to be in the playoffs. But yeah. this game specifically, my guess is if the Cowboys win this game, they need to outscore the Lions. That feels like their best shot. So if you're the Cowboys offense in this game, what answers are you trying to find against the current version of the Lions defense? Uh, just find, again, find the matchup you want. The Lions defense can be predictable. Um, I do think this could be a Lions, a, um, a big challenge, not so much a big challenge, but an answer that they can find for their front and the pass rush they can front against this Cowboys offensive line that is Tyron Smith not practicing again. Uh, you know, so if they can take advantage of that at the big tip of the cap to the Lions front, because they need that answer. But I think the Cowboys uh, for everything we just talked about the other side of the ball, the Cowboys have their own answers, but their own offense, <laughs> because they have Brandon Cooks, who's playing well. CeeDee Lamb is CeeDee Lamb, of course. And uh, Jake Ferguson is Jake Ferguson. I think Ferguson can attack over the middle down after down after down, whether the Lions want to be in quarters or cover one, the two kind of things that they do. He's an answer against both of those coverages. So I feel like every week I'm like, Ferguson, who's the player that I'm going to be watching? Ferguson, because that's what's, that's what's nice about having a good tight end, guys. He gives you nice answers. It gets a lot of stuff. That's actually, I think that that's actually a very insightful point because when the offense is rolling, he's rolling. Those two yeah. things are always happening at the same time. When they're getting him involved, that's the best version of this offense. Yes. And when they have faltered over the last couple of weeks, we just haven't seen him be a big part of the passing game. It's like manufactured stuff. It's like nakeds and bootlegs as opposed to something where there's the drop back stuff. That's what we talked about after that game or Tuesday morning uh, after the weekend. Uh, we talked about how, okay, they got to CD early and then it felt like they got away from it. All this stuff, they have to be in the flow of the offense for this to work. As soon as you see Dak double pumping, it's like, <gasps> that's when you just feel really just scared. He has been, he's great at living this year. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying the Cowboys team, this Cowboys team wins by just sheer efficiency in the offense and those explosive plays to CD and Ferguson. If that's not happening, their run game isn't even up against this Lions defense, isn't that kind of overwhelming strength that they can live on. They have to find their answers in the past game. And I think they will. I think they have matchup answers. 
the explosives to Ferguson is that is, I think that's the way to frame it because against yeah. the Bills, he had six catches, but he had six catches for 44 yards. It was all oh, underneath. Yeah. It's a version of the Cowboys offense that we no longer want to see anymore. No. We're seeking out those explosives and matching the explosives that that's, this Lions offense is going to bring, I think, becomes a huge turning point in what this game yeah. could end up being. And the front is another thing to point at. Tyron Smith, again, not practicing his replacement. Chuma Doga has also not practicing right now. We saw what Might that be better off. like last week. Without, <laughs> I mean, listen, but it's again, it's just a more moving pieces for them up front yeah. and something to keep an eye on. One more thing to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. CJ Gardner Johnson back limited Ooh, in practice yeah. could play in this game. My yeah. biggest question is how do they use him? Yeah. Because Mel Fonwu is playing very well for them yep. right now. So you have Mel Fonwu and Kirby Joseph back there. Brian Branch, obviously, in the slot. So how do they think their best personnel shakes out in the yeah. secondary if they plan on folding him back into the equation? I don't know the answer to that. I don't either. I don't think they've really given you one either. Dan Campbell was pretty cloak and dagger about it when he was discussing it this week. More DBs on the field? I mean, that's, that's exactly. That's, he was just that, like, that more the, playmakers is good was his answer. Yeah. yeah. Help the, it'll help that linebacker linebacker room just put one of them on the field just one linebacker instead of two and that'll maybe help out the lions defense on passing downs a little bit melphone was another guy when we were talking about how patient the lions defense has been yes. and the lions uh, developmental process has been over the last couple of years he's another great example a guy they drafted in 2021 had his ups and downs over his first yes. two years they've dropped him in now and he's playing the best football it's of his career he is the perfect example that in the draft process, in a traditional kind of a team room, it's year three that you're supposed to say you're supposed to wait on a guy. This is year three. And it's him him coming into the draft. He was known as kind of a project type. It's like, okay, so year three, what is he? And it's so funny. Even I do this all the time. First year and year and Andrew Thomas is a great example. First year and a half. Okay, I kind of know what this guy is. He's all right. I don't think he's gonna be anything. Okay, then second half of the year two, and then year three, he looks phenomenal. He looks elite, all pro. And it's just like, I always have to remember just some of these guys, just keep holding on. <laughs> it's like, you just, this is why we can't be impatient and sometimes say, hey, oh, that guy hasn't been anything. He's never going to be anything. It's like, you, you know, year three, year three, year three. I think that's exactly right. And we've gotten yeah. spoiled because some of their rookies have been really good right away. Amon Ross St. Brown, Sam Porta, obviously, those two guys specifically, I think guys to keep an eye on in this game because the Cowboys have struggled to defend people in the middle of the field because of those issues they've had in the spine of the defense. And I think that could be one more thing that gives them trouble in this one. So a huge game playoff implications. You know, the Lions still have an outside shot at the one seed. Doesn't seem like they're probably going to get it. The Cowboys still like have a 20% chance to win the NFC East. According to our numbers at the athletic, they need the Eagles to drop one over the last two weeks, but either way, this just feels like the sort of game that you need to start getting right for the playoffs, even if it can't help your seating at all. So that is going to be what is worth watching with this one. Other game of the week that we wanted to talk about, just another awesome game between arguably the two best teams in the AFC fighting for the one seed in the conference. If the Dolphins beat the Rams this week, <laughs> and a 10 a.m. game for you. It's a new yeah, game for me, for me but yes. What do Eastern? I'm sorry. Local time. <laughs> I was going to say, is it's a 10 a.m. Is that, am I missing something? Do I have to be up early for this game? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, oh, man. How many years now? I'm like year five, year six out here. I'm just this. Oh, no, you're eight since I was in Oakland. So this is just what I'm locked in on. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so the Dolphins clinch the AFC East and take over as the one seed in the AFC with a win. The Ravens clinch the one seed in the AFC with a win. We know how hard it is to go into Baltimore and win some of these big time games, especially these primetime games. So if the road to the Super Bowl goes through Baltimore, I don't think that's something anybody in the AFC wants. So this is a fantastic matchup mm -hmm. with a ton on the line. Yeah. And also, again, this is another thing where it's where you're trying to find answers for these teams. OK, I think we have I think. The Dolphins' defense is legit. <laughs> yeah. I think they've now proven it several times now, and I, I think they are very—they're an elite unit. I look at them top five. I mean, easily they are what we—they are who they we thought they would be. Uh, but I just think it's a lot of this team, and I want to see. It's also one of these kind of like we talked about the Lou Anarumo defenses. All right, what do they? What are they? What are they going to sprinkle out there? This was what's the McDaniel McDonald matchup going to bring to the table? Like, it's it's a great matchup. Gonna... It's a great. It's a and, great matchup. And it's because they just played the 49ers. So they're both going to be using that film to give answers to this week. So they're going to be already giving counters, even though they haven't faced each other this year. And they played last year. 
which was uh remember the dolphins went crazy at the end of the game Tua was just launching stuff against the blitz um so it's like okay so what what does we build on upon those like kind of quasi matchups they've had before well it's just a murderer's row of the offenses that the D ravens defense has had to face over the last month I, you absolutely could argue and i think this is just true I think the Rams, the Niners, and the Dolphins are the three hardest offenses in football to prepare for. Oh, yeah. All of the moving pieces, what they're going to throw yeah. at you, the game planning, just how specific you have to be with the details. Yeah. They've played all of them in the last month. I, I don't think Mike McDonald has slept since Thanksgiving. I really don't think he has. It has been absolutely brutal what has been thrown at them over the last month, but they have been willing, they've been able to answer the challenge. The yep. Rams got them a couple different times, but for the most part, we've seen this defense play very well. And that yep. game from last year, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because I love looking at that game last year and then thinking about this Ravens defense now because so you different. saw what they were trying to be in that Dolphins game yes. last year. They're trying to do all these funky coverages and funky disguises, and they get caught in it a couple times because yeah. it was week two. Yeah. You have a new defensive coordinator, you have a new defensive system, you have a new defensive identity, and they're trying to sort through it against this Dolphins offense that we had never seen before. It You'd gotten one week of tape of this version of the Dolphins, what they were with Mike McDaniel and Tyreek Hill, mm -hmm. And you have this Ravens defense that has no idea who they want to be. It is a very different story right now. Obviously, the Dolphins offense is still great, but this Ravens defense has found itself. It feels very different in December 2023 than it did in September 2022. Getting Roko on Smith helps. It just that helps. Him, that does. That and helps. That, that him and Kyle Hamilton being able to play along the middle of the defense, though. That's an easy answer for defenses that like even though no matter what coverage it is, just by where those guys line up on a lot of stats, that's going to help answer what the Dolphins like to do. Attack the middle, attack the middle, attack the middle, attack the middle over and over and over. So by the funky looks, having that personnel just step up, it's like you get the guys that match the philosophy perfectly. And it just looks like this when it's executed just so well by the players and by what the coaches are doing over there. It doesn't sound like Waddle is going to play. Adam Schefter reporting that he's unlikely to play in this game. So one less thing for the Ravens to yeah. worry about. Just on a structural level, big picture stuff, how the Ravens play defensively is how you want to play against the Dolphins. Variety of coverages, yep. hard to understand what you're going to be in, a lot of too high coverages. The Ravens last week against the Niners used cover six. So cover two on one side, cover four on another side on 28% of their snaps. That is a very, very high percentage. That would be by far the highest percentage in the league over the course of a single year. And I assume they're going to do a lot of that again, where you're clouding one side and Tyreek Hill's side is probably going to be what that is. So that mix of coverages, including a lot of two high zone coverages, that's how you want to approach the Dolphins. And unlike the Cowboys, that is a world the Ravens are very comfortable living in. The way you have to approach the Dolphins is the way they want to approach the game. So at least that aligns for them. Yeah, the the pitch plays, the, the pin pull stuff. I'm curious, like if the Dolphins try any of that, because that's what naturally that cover two stuff and the the shell stuff can do, the cloud stuff can do. Um, I'm curious if it's going to be some traditional good old eye formation Alec Ingold runs right down the throat of the Ravens defense. Really, just hey, if you guys want to be funky, we're going to have an adjuster blocking, and he can adjust to what you guys are doing, and we can zone it up. We can kind of do all those zone lead stuff, the outside lead stuff. Um, because I think the 49ers got them a couple times with that because mm -hmm. it's, it's a good answer. Outside zone, and I'll talk about this point later, but outside zone is just has answers. That's why teams used to run it. That's why Shanahan's found that they found an answer before everyone else did was that, hey, if we lean into this, no matter what the defense runs, we have an answer for it because we just run outside zone all the time. So leaning into that is something the Dolphins can naturally do. So I'm curious if they keep this game script close, which I think they could, you know, if they could just keep at it and what the answers are going to be against this Ravens defense. Well, it's funny. I think one of the reasons that worked is a lot of the reasons that teams have pitted away from outside zone is that the defenses are giving you these five man surfaces, right? Yeah. So you have five down linemen, all these bare fronts. The Ravens went away from that mm -hmm. because they wanted to play with three guys off the line of scrimmage. So they're playing like traditional four, three looks with Malik Nicole. Harrison back there. And that's why some of those pressures from Patrick Queen are coming off the edge because he's a four, three outside linebacker in some Makes of these sense. looks. I don't think we'll see that in this game because I think no matter what 
sort of 21 personnel, et cetera, the Dolphins are throwing out there. My guess is based on the strengths of Miami versus the strengths of San Francisco, the Dolphin or the Ravens are going to match this stuff with nickel for the most part would be my guess coming oh, yeah. into the game and whether the Dolphins can run on them when they're in those looks, I think becomes a big question. Well, and I, I think it's the difference between the 49ers is they have Kittle and mm -hmm. the Dolphins do not. And as no, no offense to Smythe, but it just, you know, but he is not Kittle blocking. Uh, so I think that's why you are more comfortable matching with nickel in the fronts that nickel could present, because then you're not worried about your guys getting row graded because you're bumping down guys on the front and also just on the back end if they climb to the second level. So that, I think that's why, too, it's like match speed with speed, because that's what they lean into. The only other thing I'll mention on this side of the ball that I find interesting is that the Ravens coming into last week according to sports info solutions had allowed the biggest boom play percentage on defense so just an explosive play that i think is worth one epa for the offense it doesn't really matter it's just big time explosives they had allowed the biggest rate in the league against jet motion and what do the dolphins love to do all right. of those right. speed motions with fast players the niners did some of that but they were doing it with the use check and i you mm -hmm. it's just different when it's coming from this dolphins team so do we see some of that because the rate the rams caught the Ravens defense with some of that stuff when they played so that one element of the matchup I think does favor Miami even if again structurally the Ravens defense lines up pretty well against them if any team's gonna find an answer to it, it'll be the Ravens because they all they just get exposed to it week after week they're probably just like okay again and early on against 49ers you could tell they had answers it was cool like you see them signaling and checking into special game plan stuff against some of those jet looks I, I keep coming back to that second play of the game it's, it's standing out to me but they knew what that Niners were about to lean into. So again, it's it's you become curious about like, okay, the Dolphins play, the quote unquote, the RPO play. What's the Ravens answer to it? It's like, what's your flavor to answer this staple play that the Dolphins run? That's why I'm just very curious what they lean into. It's great for the Ravens because they're going to be very battle tested by the time they get to the playoffs. <laughs> they've seen all the best offenses in the league and they've consistently yeah. found answers. And we talked about it before the season. I, I thought that Mike McDonald was going to be somebody we really we're talking about a lot over the course of the year that his name was going to become more and more prominent and the cries about how good of a coach he was were going to be louder and louder by the end of the season and guess what we're there i mean he is considered like the guy on defense right now based on the way that this team has played all season and i think it's deserved because you've seen how many answers they have to all of these offenses and some of the unconventional ways that they've tried to find them yeah or i would say unconventional modern ways yeah modern uh, yes modern. yes this yeah is, yes it's postmodern defense but it's also it's always the good stuff it's always the it's what made it a pain in the ass on peyton is you had to switch it up everyone's like oh you got to heat up peyton that's that's why the jaguars are gonna draft two defensive ends and this is why everybody has to load up on pass rushers it's like yeah that does help but also just like you gotta mess with them because yeah. otherwise it's a slow death and he'll just get you but it's like hey like you just gotta mess with them because once in a while you'll catch them look what happened to purdy last week once in a while you'll catch these guys i'm not comparing peyton manning with Bert Brock Purdy, but I'm just using this analogy, just saying this is how you mess with quarterbacks. This is how you mess with passing games is you just have to be once in a while, not once in a while. You have to run the basics, but just change it up all the time. It's another really good test for a Dolphins defense that answered the bell against Dallas last week. I mean, they had not played a lot of high quality offenses this year as they piled up some of those numbers that we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. They play Dallas and they do a really damn good job. It wasn't dominant, but the Cowboys had their share of struggles moving the ball. The one difference here is that they have not played a running game like the Ravens running game. So that is one area where this is going to be a different sort of challenge, especially the way that Miami likes to play. They play with the lightest boxes in the league, and we could talk about some of the nuances of that. But can they play that way and play that kind of Fangio style against a Ravens team that wants to line up and run the ball against you, unlike any team that they've played so far this year? The Commanders and Jets run games don't scare you. They don't, they, don't, uh, they don't scare you at all. And they, they played the Eagles this year, but the Eagles don't want to run the ball anymore. They so just, you just have to pull it out of them. Just violence. It's, it's good for you. Just eat, eat your vegetables. Um, I, I think in this side, too, it's going to come down to tackling, which is like it's so basic, but it's, it's so true in this game. You got a defense that is they, they're built to, of course, be that vice grip on an offense, you know, condense, condense, make everything feel tight. But you have to tackle because you have Lamar, of course. You have Gus Edwards, who is a, a strength guy. So if your guys are tackling from the side and if you want to play light, and then they also have the receivers who, you know, uh, as the season flowers and practicing because of calf, but you still have OBJ and a little bit of Rashad Bateman and even a little bit of Isaiah likely at tight end. Like those guys can create yards after the catch. So they have to tackle. Uh, but I, I think I'm really curious is that do the Dolphins blitz? 
they what's one out of 10 times at fourth lowest rate in the NFL and Lamar could be up and down against blitz. Like he's below average and success rate in EPA against the blitz. So I'm curious if they heat him up a little bit, but I I'm just, yeah, I, I think this is gonna be an awesome matchup because I really do think it's gonna be Lamar, the extender versus a dolphins defense. That's playing like a hive mind right now with a really good front. That's my concern is that do they even need to blitz to consistently cause issues to this Ravens offensive line where there's guys in and out of the lineup. Ronnie Stanley has been struggling. They're on a pitch count. They're rotating tackles. And we've talked consistently about this Dolphins front just taking over games recently. So is that matchup between Bradley Chubb and the left tackle for the Ravens enough where they don't even need to send extra bodies to the quarterback? And thankfully, last week, Lamar was able to put on the cape often enough that it didn't matter, but he may need to do it again and consistently asking him to be the one that's mitigating any sort of pressure that you're facing, I think that becomes an issue. And against this Dolphins team, it's not like it's just coming from one spot either. They've got a bunch of guys that can win those one-on-one matchups no matter where they're lining up. And and they, like I said, we brought the the blitz stat, but they rush four a lot, just four. And they're really tied into their coverage rules. And that's what makes it so hard is they... This match coverage that they run, it's just so tied into the one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, Mississippi of the quarterback's timing, which then makes quarterbacks hold on the ball. What's the pass rush get home? But this is where Lamar's got to be Lamar. Like he's got to find windows. All right. We got to break that three second, you know, chokehold that you have on us. Let's make it three and a half seconds. Let's make it four seconds. Can you cover that 40 times? Like what, let's pop one open. We pop open a hole in the zone, create new throwing angles against a very traditionally tied and very well schooled defense you have to be unconventional you have to break their rules you have to be messy and schoolyard football but you know lamar jackson so this is exactly the perfect formula for a game where he could take over and really be lamar jackson i'm curious where they put their receivers in terms of who's outside who's in the slot and how they attack the dolphins that way because we talked about this when the cowboys put cd in the slot against kohu they had some gashes to be found so who is that receiver that the ravens feel good about if we're going to put him on some big crossers in the slot is that flowers is that obj is that bateman is it all of them is it just we're throwing to the guy who's in the slot that becomes right. the biggest question for me is who's in that Nelson situation Aguilar. And, yeah when does that come <laughs> up and who do you feel comfortable there and then yep. you can get xavian howard every once in a while one-on-one right now Especially CD got him on a slant in that game. Some of that stuff maybe toward the middle of the field when you're it's a three by one and you have him isolated on the backside because you said this. Ramsey often is on the defense's right right now. So if you can have those moments where you have Howard alone, can OBJ or Zay Flowers, whoever went on some of those. So how they attack this Dolphins secondary just based on where guys are lined up, that's something I'm curious about. <laughs> last last one here that I want that I did want to mention. The Dolphins have been good at defending the run this year, even though they play with the lightest boxes in the league. But against heavier bodies, they've been better. So when they when teams play heavy, the Dolphins play with seven or more guys in the box on like 70% of plays. So, But when teams play 11 personnel, they play with light boxes on like 75% of plays, and they've been significantly worse defending the run in those looks. And the Ravens, coincidentally, have been much better at running the ball out of some of those spread looks out of 11 this year. So if the Ravens put three receivers on the field and they can get some of those really light boxes, Mm -hmm. is that a situation where they can find some success on the ground? So that's just one kind of early down strategic thing that I'm curious about and how that's going to unfold. It's kind of a game where you're almost glad you have Gus Edwards as kind of your main back with Lamar because it's just Gus up the middle. You're spreading them out and just dicing them vertically. And then also I think the Ravens' best runs are when Lamar is the stretch element as opposed to vertical element, and then you use Gus Edwards as the vertical element, mm-hmm. all their replays, their GT counters, all that stuff. So I I think the spread to run look is the best, and then the condensed to pass look. It's a traditional get them where you don't want to get them in the matchup that they don't want to be in. I think that's exactly how you go against this. Again, it's it's traditional stuff. It's it's kind of fun, like in this matchup that you don't think would be. It's a very traditional um answer matchup that you have to find. Kyle Hamilton, still not practicing, dealing with that knee issue. That is going to be something to continue to watch. If he's going to play in this game, that makes a huge difference for this Ravens defense. We've seen what he is for them. Kevin Zeitler also dealing with some lower body issues, and that's just one more thing to worry about for the Ravens offensive line. But all in all, this is shaping up to be a phenomenal game. So those are two big games of the week, but we got a lot of other games that have pretty important playoff implications. So we are going to quickly run through four of those, talk about what's at stake and maybe one or two things to watch on either side of the ball. 
Bucks playing the Saints. Saints at Bucks this weekend. The Bucks clinch the NFC South with a win. The Saints are still alive. If they win, they have like a 31% chance to make the playoffs. They're virtually okay. eliminated with a loss. So this is one of those games where talking about the Bucks just kind of rolling and the good vibes that are existing down there and them somehow having the best plan of any team in the NFC South this offseason by kind of doing nothing. <laughs> that was the Bucks' plan this offseason. And it made sense, right? You have all of this dead money from the Brady maneuver. You don't have a lot of money to spend in free agency. So all they did was they ate, they took all of it on the chin in one year. They spent $4 million on a quarterback. They hit, have some hits in the draft, the way that Yaya Diaby is playing. Kalash mm -hmm. Kansi's had some nice moments for them. Cody Mock is starting for them. And that's what the Bucks did. They did absolutely nothing. And somehow they set themselves up to be the NFC South champion. On the other side of this, the Saints pushed all of their chips into the middle. And there is a chance with the loss to Baker Mayfield on this Bucks team this weekend, they are done in the postseason conversation. Uh, it's very much the strategy in Jurassic Park for uh, when they, the T-Rex breaks the gate, breaks the breaks through. You got, I think you have uh, Dr. Grant is the Bucks. Just stay still. It's got the vision of a toad. <laughs> and then you have the Saints who are Ian Malcolm, who rip the flare open and go, hey, 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 and get tossed into the bathroom and get found later with a broken leg and gushed open. And then I think that's the Saints, the Bucks, and how they stand right now. Have fun with that, Kent Garrison. Uh, but I think this is, <laughs> but uh, I do, I, I'm like, it's fascinating. The Bucks, the the whole, my like, I remember when we were previewing this division and the Bucks kind of synopsis, it was just kind of like, they have players and it's like, that's it. They have players and they have a quarterback wing in it, and it's fun to watch right now. And I think we, I'm glad we've talked about him a few times this past few weeks because it is fun to watch. You see him Baker back there ripping it, you see him throwing with confidence. He is all athletes are based on confidence. I mean, all of them, everyone in life is based on confidence, but Baker, like, that's his superpower. It's like the more confident he is, the better he becomes. Like, he is just that's how he goes. And as soon as that wavers, then you could just see him double clutching and try and do the scramble stuff. So, watching this kind of Bucks team right now, what they have and what they are and how they're playing it's a lot of fun like you said the rejuvenation of some of these young players some of the ascension of some of their young players then also just dominance from like Antoine Winfield and other guys it's like oh yeah Tristan Wirfs you're good Mike Evans you're great Chris Godwin good like it's like oh yeah this is a lot of fun these are good players I thought that Derek Klassen said something interesting today or this week on Twitter when he was talking about Baker and this is how I feel watching Baker this year him not losing his mind every single time there's something flashing at him in the pocket is the ultimate difference. He's just stepping up in the pocket and that 25% uptick in calmness yeah. when things are happening around him to me explains almost everything that's happening right yeah. now with him and with the Buccaneers offense. He became less skittish and like the whole franchise did too. It's like it, it, he he took his CBD gummies and he's good. Like he's just <laughs> calmed, got a feeling of calm, and that's how he's now he's playing right now. But it's so true though, because just remember him at, at the end of his days in Cleveland. Like it was just he'd do those deep dropbacks and he'd just do the man dropbacks where he's trying to get depth and he's trying to scramble. The bailing to the right. It was the almost the yips the right. at one point where he's just he bailing to the right all the time. As soon as he hit the top of his drop, bail to the right. You know, he felt bad for the right tackle over time. So it's just, cause the guy just kept going, oh, 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 sorry. Uh, but that's just how it felt. And this is completely opposite. That he's ripping throws from the pocket, straight dropbacks. I, I brought up the stat, but this is the most he's ever done a straight straight dropbacks in his life. Most non-play action, non-screen, straight dropbacks. And this is his best. He's an air raid quarterback. Just let him be an air raid quarterback. You're going to take some lows with it, but that's his best baker. And this is how they're winning. And I think they're leaning into it and it works. The problem with the Saints' overall strategy this year is that the offense needed to be fine with Derek Carr. For all of this to come together, the defense needed to remain elite. Yeah. Right now, the Saints are 22nd in weighted defensive DVOA. 22nd. They're mm -hmm. getting pushed around up front. They have no pass rush right now. It, it's all falling apart at the exact wrong moment. And one specific area that I'm watching in this game Alante Taylor got benched last week because of everything yeah. the Rams were doing to them in the slot. Is this a game where Chris Godwin has a monster day because of the struggles that they're having against slot receivers right now and with his head kind of spinning a little bit? So that, that's just one specific mm -hmm. thing. But right now, even though it's only minus the Bucks are only minus two and a half in this game, it is really hard not to feel significantly better about where Tampa is than where the Saints are right now. And I would not be surprised if they sewed up the division this week at all. Yeah, it's just going to be 
you know, just the Saints have weapons and it's just they've played against this defense before. And like that's the Bulls thing. It's like sometimes he catches the end, sometimes you have answers and can catch them. So I, I think it's all going to come up to how the Saints offense moves the ball and how they can find answers. Like you said, Derek Carr has to <laughs> play, like he has to do well. Like that's going to, like, that's how they're going to live and die, obviously. I think this Bucks offense going against the Saints defense back to that side is, I think there's going to be a lot of third and longs. So I think it's going to come over a lot to third down on that side of the ball. That's what it feels like because this Bucks run game, because of the interior, even with the Saints kind of getting older up there, they can still kind of thump you a little bit. So it's going to come on down to those third downs and it's come down to the receivers winning against those corners. So which is always an interesting matchup with Mike Evans against the Saints. Well, no Marshall and Lattimore. I know, so, right? I that's one of the biggest. <laughs> that's why I didn't say Lattimore. Lattimore is that I said the Saints. <laughs> for the most part, th those games, Marshawn Lattimore has done a very good job of racing Mike Evans in some of those matchups. But now you're not dealing with that. Mike Evans may be set up for the sort of game he typically isn't against New Orleans. So uh, I cannot believe we're here in week 17 I where I feel this way about the Bucks and this way about the Saints. But that is where we've arrived. And there's a chance they put away the division before we even get to the new year. Next one here. Packers at Vikings game is on Sunday night. This is basically a loser leaves town match. Yeah. The, the Packers is. are entering week 17 with a 29% chance to make the playoffs, according to our Austin mock. That goes to a 59% chance with a win. So a win this week is monstrous, and they very much have a path to this thing because the pa the Rams right now are, have the inside track, but then the Rams have the Giants this week, but the Rams have the Niners in week 18. The Niners probably have to win that game to keep the one seed. So if the Rams lose to the Niners and the Packers win out, the Packers are in. And that is huge. So this is a huge game for the Packers because their chances are very real given what the Rams have to face over the next two weeks. Yeah, I've had many of uh, holidays ruined by Packers Vikings holiday games, usually New Year's or Christmas related. A lot of late season games and a lot of a lot of tears, a lot of tears in the Tice household. Uh, so it, this this is a game after my own heart, uh, <laughs> broken hearts. Uh, but I, I'm excited for this game. I think I'm very excited for the, the when the Packers against this Vikings defense, because I just think, again, it's a, one of these defenses is how do they answer it. And like, I'm, I'm curious. I like seeing what LaFleur designs. I like seeing Jordan Love get after defenses and whip it all over the yard. It's very, very fun. So I'm excited for this game. I like this Packers team. I think the Vikings are now starting a rookie quarterback again. They're going back to Hall. They are. So no more Mullins experience uh, with Jaron Hall. But I, I feel like he was kind of a side character in this matchup, even though he did throw for 400 and something yards last week. And, and no offense to Nick Mullins, but I feel like the other players in the other matchups of this game are very interesting on both sides of the ball. I'm curious about that decision to go to Jaron Hall because looking at what the Packers defense is right now, uh -huh. the volatility of Mullins, I think you could argue is both a good or bad thing because they, they would find explosives against this Packers defense for the most part. But it's is like Kevin O'Connell thinking no matter who we trot out there, a quarterback, we're going to be able to find those. We just need someone who's not going to turn the ball over three times. It, or, or, it's, or it's like a uh, kind of a mother animal weakening the prey let the babies you know like chop on it i don't know where i'm going with like more t-rex references but that's, that's kind of <laughs> that, that that's a lost world one but that's why that could feel like that a little bit too let's weaken it a little bit here you go hey hey build, build up some confidence for the young guy a little bit see what you got um that's that side of the ball too it's that i the jair alexander who's splendid after oh my god i've best sequence to discover all that i think i got to go through you explained to me live on the show and then I got to see the video and the sequence and everything. And it was just like, oh, my God, it's like someone telling you about a movie. And you're like, just like, oh, no way. And then you actually get to watch it. But the experience of that last year, week 17, the Packers held Justin Jefferson just one catch in the first half in their week 17 matchup. And the Packers ended up blowing out the Vikings. So even with so even with Jair, Jair Alexander in there, they double team Justin Jefferson the mm -hmm. entire game. Cover two bracket, which was hilarious because Alexander was talking crap after made it sound like he manned him up the entire game one on one. But if you watch it, it was like play after play after play. If he was outside, it was cover two. If he was inside, they ran one double, like just like a good old Patriots defense. Um, so I didn't think the Jair Alexander Alexander like loss is as devastating as maybe you would think, because I think they're going to run the exact same game plan. And having said all that, I think they're going to pound the freaking rock 
I think even last year when this Vikings offense couldn't really run the ball consistently, they're one of the, they're facing one of the worst run defenses. They still got after him last year. And I think this year, again, same story, but the Vikings run the offense is much better and can take advantage of those looks and the soft coverages and the soft, all the attention that's focused on Jefferson every snap. My concern is with all that attention on Justin Jefferson, no TJ Hawkinson in this game, yeah. because that was one of the biggest things with this team compared to other iterations of the Vikings over the last couple of years, that those secondary pass catchers were just so much better than they were in the first half of last season when only Justin Jefferson was, was just Jefferson was all you had to worry about. But now TJ Hawkinson's on injured reserve. Jordan Addison is not practicing. So for this Packers defense, is this finally a chance to maybe right the ship a little bit against a fifth round rookie quarterback and a Vikings team that's missing its second and third best pass catchers? And if this is their plan, I think that they just stick with it. That's a fair plan. I think you just got to try and see if you can hold up in the run game, which is I know like Packers fans are like, really, we have to play run defense. That's what you're telling us. This game is decided by Joe Barry and his run defense. It's like. Yeah, <laughs> this is it. This is this is your ticket. This is how you're gonna have to do it. So I, I think it's gonna be interesting because I really do think that's what their strategy is gonna be. Like I'm just like kind of I, I feel pretty like confident that's what their defense is gonna be throughout this game. It's not like Joe Barry mixes it up too much. So I feel like he's gonna repeat a previous performance. I'm curious how Jordan Love is gonna deal with some of the wonkiness of this Vikings defense. He was fine when they brought extra extra pass rushers last time. He was a nightmare when they dropped eight. One of seven for four yards, yeah. including an interception when the Vikings dropped eight in that last time. So I assume we're going to see a ton of that, the same way we have every single every, Vikings every game week. all yeah. year, yeah. essentially. So what the Packers' answers are against those looks compared to what they were last time could go a long way in determining this game. And and I, I that Spags Chiefs game was great for this Packers offense and, and Jordan Love. I think just the protection answers they had to come up with. So I think that's another kind of um thing on their resume, something they could build off of a few weeks ago. But I, I do if the Packers play to their best selves, if they don't play young, I'm gonna say as a, as a very inexperienced group, if they don't have the drops, they don't have the missed routes, which they have improved upon, but they still have some frustrating moments is they do have answers. Uh, LaFleur and, and their offensive line group is great at protections. I think also they have they have great rules. They get creative, which is what you have to be against this Vikings defense. Um, I think Jordan Love has no conscious. Like he's just he's just going to fire it everywhere. It's just just that's what he does. Uh, but you have to do you have to do that. I think even I think the drop eight point is so good though because that is it. Not only does he have to be confident in finding throws against drop eight on time. But also his receivers have to find the soft spots in the zone and be confident mm -hmm. where the spots they have. They have to have a connection there. So it's a great test of it. Uh, I mean, for this young team, I will say the run game, again, because I'm always going to bring up the run game, the Vikings defense, zone runs is how you get after them. Packers are kind of average, but they're okay running the zone runs. But Aaron Jones is good at it. So Aaron Jones's health is very important for this Packers run game because they're going to have to get outside and be run all those outside zone runs like I brought up before. Next one here, Steelers at Seahawks. Steelers coming into the game with a 12% chance to make the playoffs. It only goes to a 24% chance if they win, according to our numbers. So still a long road. They need a lot of help. The Seahawks come in with a 69% chance to make the playoffs. That goes to 88% with a win. They have the Cardinals in Week 18. This feels like a game the Seahawks should win. Even with some of their unevenness over the course of the season, this feels like a game the Seahawks should win. So why am I so terrified? about them playing against this Steelers team. And I think it comes down to one simple thing. They can't protect Geno Smith way too often. And you're playing against the Steelers front, and yep. that might be enough for the Steelers to keep pace in this game. You think about what the first half of that Titans game looked like and their inability to keep him upright, especially on third down, and now you're going against TJ Watt and everything else that Steelers defense is throwing at you. So if I'm a Seahawks fan, even if they're supposed to win this thing, and even if a win pretty much gets them in, I am not feeling overly confident as you head into this matchup. Nope, it's uh they they have to block. That was kind of my key to the game. <laughs> it's 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 really everything with the Seahawks because they want to be aggressive. Geno Smith wants to fire down the field. Their run game is inconsistent because Kenneth Walker is naturally consistent. He's very boom busty, but it doesn't help if the reads aren't clean naturally. Like if that's just not the reads aren't clean, he's not gonna like find the natural read. But once in a while he'll boom one because he'll bounce something to the outside. But this interior line is going to have their hands full. Like Keanu Benton's probably better than any of their interior three. And that's a rookie second rounder. 
Um, I think, you know, of course the outside guys, they're going to ask him to hold up. Like they have been letting cross and Lucas kind of just have one-on-ones for better, for worse. Cause they're trying to get everybody out, but that's also like, you're going to have some negatives. If you do that, if you're going to be that aggressive, you're just gonna, that's what's going to Our Arden key got him last week. Our oh, Arden key got, got Charles Cross. So he got him bad. And it was, it was yeah. one of those. that's like a sack in two seconds where Gino just got crushed from the yes. blind side. And, and so those are the things you have to worry about in this game, playing against the Steelers. The next play was hilarious because, um, he got off the snap really quick after that yes. sack happened and Gino gets catches the ball and he glances just to make sure that he got blocked and then he like continues his drop but it was it was pretty funny he had a one two moment and then he was fine Gino's tough but it was that was a that was a big hit that was, it, was a, it was a huge hit and yeah. again yeah he tried to time it up the next snap and got he got called for offsides but yeah that that Seahawks offense I, I want to make it more complicated than this it really isn't that much more complicated than this when they hold up they look pretty damn good when they don't they struggle That's the it. one other thing though I don't love their third down answers against man coverage sometimes it just feels a little too static for me yeah. like I just give me some more in breaking stuff with there's a reason JSN exists like, I just want to see yeah. them attack over the middle of the field more often with him, period, and specifically in some of those situations. They're making yeah. too too many, and this is by virtue of the structure of the play, too many low percentage outside the numbers throws in some of those high leverage moments. I mean, think about that third and 14 they hit to him with a game on the line. They had a slant to him in the third quarter that went for a chunk gain. Like, I just want to see a little bit more of those and not asking Gino to make these hero throws over and over and over again, it, especially it, against the Steelers team that struggles in that area of the field. No yeah. Minka, the linebackers are all over the place. Like that seems like a place you need to take advantage of them right now. Yeah, it, it's it's going to come down to third and logs, I think, because I don't think the Seahawks run game is going to have an advantage. So those third and logs are going to be so important. They... I, I go back and forth, and this is a can't and won't thing. And I've always like it, you don't know unless you know the guys, know all the players, and coach them, or and in the meeting room and everything. But I think once they get more complicated, and they try to maybe do bunch releases and stack releases and more motion. Their receivers become less effective because they just can't handle handle it. And that's just a and that theory. may be it. That's just a theory. Like I, I, but as watching the Seahawks team the last few years, um, DK Metcalf can have some moments where he has mental lapses. It's just the player he is. JSN's a rookie. He had some moments early in the year. He's gotten a lot better as the season's gone along. And the Lockett has had some moments too. So, but I just think just because of that, and even a guy like Kenneth Walker, it's like I think that's why they try to keep it kind of a little more simple, or at least uh, uh, just keep the looks as simple as possible. That's just a theory again. And maybe maybe that's the answer. But if that is the answer, it is holding it's them tough. back in some of those moments. They've struggled against man coverage this year. They've been yeah. one of the worst teams in the NFL with teams playing man against them. And the Steelers are willing to do it, especially mm -hmm. when you get into third down. So that's something Joey I'm watching Porter for. Joey Porter Jr. is a great matchup for DK. Ex exactly. So yeah. if you're going to make him battle Joey Porter Jr. on yeah. the outside, physically, that is no longer a matchup advantage for you where it is against almost any other corner in the league. So if they want to play the Steelers game in those moments, I think they're going to struggle. On the other side of the ball, you buying this Mason Rudolph thing? I have no idea what to think of it, man. I, I have no idea. There's actually some moments of like real stuff. Like there was, life. yeah, and some, I, of, some of it's weird, right? He, uh, yeah, yeah. Pickens takes a slant like, eighty yeah. yards. It's whatever. Oh, I There's know. A There's <laughs> <laughs> screamed as that happened. <laughs> Pickens takes a slant eighty yards. Another go ball touchdown. But there uh -huh. was more pure quarterbacking and more down to down yep. consistency yep. with the offense with Mason Rudolph than I think they've had really all season yep. with anyone else playing quarterback. It's because like Trubisky's game is not like sitting in the pocket and reading stuff out. It's bad. Yeah. You don't say. Right? Yeah. Right. So it's uh, yeah, not going left either. So, but it's at least, you know, with Rudolph, it's like, all right, at least he's trying some stuff from the pocket within the confines of the offense and he's doing fine. He's giving his guys chances. I don't know. It's better than what they had, at least for that little glimmer, just keep him away from helmets. Uh, they, but also they like this Seahawks defense is, you know, Jamal Adams is not playing. It looks a little bit more sound, a little bit more speedy, especially on the back end felt a lot more unclogged. I will say, uh, just watching them. I think it's a very static defense though, versus a very static offense, which mm -hmm. is just going to be watching some going from this is an afternoon game. I, I believe, right? Yeah. It's at Seattle. Only one of three afternoon games, one of 10 morning games uh, on Sunday. So we're going to go from Ravens defense, Dolphins offense, and all the movement. And then we're going to go to this afternoon game. It's going to be Steelers offense versus the Seahawks defense. 
it's just color to black and white and it couldn't be any more opposite of how these teams use their personnel i this is very fitting though for the seahawks in my opinion if they win this game they're likely in the playoffs if they lose this game they don't deserve to be in the playoffs it's almost a fair outcome here it feels right that the Steelers need to beat, excuse me, that the Seahawks need to beat this Steelers team in order to get into the postseason. The Steelers are the exact right sort of challenge yeah. for where the Seahawks are. If you can beat the Steelers in this moment, congratulations. You get to be in the playoffs. The it's moves that you match. made, the short-term moves that you made, some of the kind of quick fix things to win right now, some of that is justified. You're in the playoffs. You made it. If you can't beat the Steelers team, that's a problem. That is a problem that speaks to larger issues for who yeah. you are and who you thought you were going to be coming into the year. Those uh, still exist, yeah. by the way, no matter what the outcome is here, but it's a little bit easier to stomach if you actually get it. And also it's like they it's at home too. Like it's one thing to lose at Dallas and some Thursday night, you know, blow by blow match. Like, okay, that's one thing. That's a true contender. At least we thought with that defense, uh, but it's like, but this is different. This is like, again, like you played the Titans last week at Tennessee and everything, but they're feisty, but it's like, okay, but you have to win these games, especially if you're going to be a, be a true, true playoff team. Last one here. And this is a huge game with very real implications. The Raiders at the Colts. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the things that matter here. The Raiders enter week 17 with a 15% chance to make the playoffs. It goes to a 36% chance if they win. But there are outcomes here for the Raiders. If the Some Raiders of the best go, odds you'll find in Vegas. That, that right there. That is right there. <laughs> if the Raiders go nine and eight, so if they win their next two games against the Colts and against the Broncos team, with starting Jared Stidham at quarterback, True. if they go nine and eight, and the Colts, Texans, Steelers, and Bengals are also nine and eight, which is possible, mm -hmm. the Raiders would get in. The Raiders would win the and that they would that would require the Steelers beating a couple the Seahawks years ago and not the Ravens after Gruden was let go like and they had an interim coach like isn't this exactly what happened like all these once one in like a hundred playoff scenario things happened like certain teams won and it's lost like it's like one in it's one in ten right now if they win it's one in three so they need some okay. things to go their way yeah. but if all of these teams to get to get to nine and eight. The Raiders will have beaten the Colts and beaten the Steelers. So they need a little bit of help, but this is not out of the question for no, them to get in. It's not. That's for the amazing. Colts, they need they enter this week with a 54% chance to make the playoffs. It goes to 74% if they win this game. So this does have real potential impact. This could have real potential impact on what the AFC playoffs look like. And it's not as if the Colts are a significantly better team than the Raiders. No. I could absolutely see the Raiders winning this game. I actually felt better about the Raiders when I started breaking this game down. <laughs> when I kind of just just because of the matchups. Uh, it, honestly, I think this whole game comes down to how do the Raiders defense defends the Colts RPOs? Do you stop the runs and do you stop the RPOs and make it third and long and make Gardner Minshew drop back over and over against Max Crosby and this Raiders kind of resurgent Raiders front? That's the game. Like really, that's how I feel the game because like. It's Aiden O'Connell and, and you know like the Raiders offense is okay. Like they do some okay things. Um, but it's going to be the Colts corners against, you know, who are both rookies against Devontae Adams and Jacoby Myers, and then just the other side of the ball. So it's like, those are kind of just the matchups I'm looking at. Cause I feel like that's what's decides this whole game on both sides of the ball. Uh, the Raiders offense, obviously, I mean, the passing game was non-existent last week against the chiefs, but the Colts defense is not the chiefs defense. No, they absolutely can move the ball in this game. And with the way that their defense is playing, I would not be surprised if they ended up winning. Yeah. And if this Raiders team made the playoffs after how it started and how that first month and a half of the season went under Josh McDaniels, that would be absolutely incredible for them. It would be great for them. And Dude, then the defense is playing so well that I kind of so well. want to see them do it legitimately. Well, like legitimately well, like it's a, it's a good defense. They're doing a great job. I know we've talked about them a little bit, but like really studying them this week. It's like, yeah, they're doing such a good job, such a fun defense right now. And I like Max Crosby is just amazing to watch. Like his, it's truly a joy to watch. And it's like, cause you could see how everybody else feeds off of it, especially not that they're winning games. I mean, even just the post game stuff is hilarious. Like all the Instagram live stuff. I, in my mock, because the vibes are so good, almost had the Raiders moving. I did no trades, but almost had the Raiders moving up to number two to take Caleb Williams because uh, I just felt like that would just be a like perfect fit in Las Vegas. We talked about this. Chase and I did the early look at the quarterback carousel heading into next year on our show this week. And the Raiders, to me, are one of the most fascinating teams. Yeah. 
because they'll have about $75 million in cap space when no matter with a couple quick, easy cuts, mm -hmm. they're probably going to be out of range to draft one of the top quarterbacks, but there might be a few more first round quarterbacks that we're not thinking about, or that are going to be available when they draft. Yeah, no. But is this a team, let's say the Cardinals move on from Kyler Murray. What if you just dropped Kyler Murray onto the Raiders? I love that. I, I really would. Uh, yeah. They have room for it. They have room for it financially. Yeah. Kyler's cap hits over the next three or four years are totally palatable. Yeah. They actually remind me a lot of where Jared Goff's finances were when he was traded. The uh, Kyler got a huge signing bonus. So mm -hmm. if you go look at Kyler's contract right now, the proration for the signing bonus is like $13 million a year. That's all the Cardinals. So his base salaries over the next three years are like 34 million. In 2025, it's 20 million plus a $12 million roster bonus. In 2026, it's like 35 million. And if you wanted to play around with those, you convert that $34 million yeah. base salary next year into a signing bonus and you just spread yeah. that shit out and the Cardinals can get creative too. Like they get, they could do a lot, <laughs> and, but the Cardinals, if when, if, when the Cardinals were picking third, I could understand being like, okay, we'll roll with Cowher. But if yeah. they like those two quarterbacks, I think it, same conversation it's, we're having about the bears. It could make sense to turn the page. Yeah. Are the Raiders a Justin Fields team? If, the Bears end up taking a quarterback. So what the Raiders ultimately do a quarterback with the defense, with the way that this unit is playing has become very interesting to me because I think that they're a team that could go in a bunch of different directions. Oh, I totally agree. They they were hard because I I was tempted to give them a quarterback and then to kind of the mock stuff got messy. <laughs> so I was like, oh, Harrison Jr. Uh, yeah, they, I, Harrison Jr. and Trey McBride's fun, right, guys? But even like, because Kyler to me, I watched him now he's played probably about five six games now there's been a lot of good you can see he's getting adjusted to kind of like a real real nfl offense and again drew petzing i think is doing a great job there in arizona uh but i also think there has been moments where he's missing guys and he just looks rusty and he just looks like he's a step slow as far as throwing the ball not step slow i think actually his wheels are still pretty good right now but steps are throw reading out and get rid of the ball and i i think uh, that's why i'm curious is like what they think of that do they think that's like, hey, hey, he's going to figure it out? Like, look how close he is? Or do they think like, oh, shoot, he can't hit that? It's gonna, I'm so curious what their internal thinking of it is because I could argue I think it's either closer way. to the former. I, I, I don't think they're disappointed in what they've seen I don't from think him so, so far. But it becomes a question of, okay, even if you're not disappointed, are you thrilled enough to not take the free do-over? And right. especially if he's going to have a market because I do think he would have a market. There are going to be some teams that are left without a seat when the music stops with these top two quarterbacks and that need an answer at the position. So there are going to be three, four teams, potentially. They're going to be in the market for one of these guys. Derek Carr got $40 million, $37.5 million a year from the Saints in free agency. Kyler Murray is going to be about that over yeah, the next book. three years. Yeah. So there is going to be a team out there if he does not stick in Arizona that, in my opinion, is going to be willing to give up a first round pick for Kyler Murray. So and if you're the Cardinals, the decision you have to make is, is it worth having an extra first plus starting over the financial clock at a quarterback or do we want Kyler Murray? So I don't think they need to be disappointed with him necessarily to justify moving on from him. No, and I, that's also just the moments of what Kyler is and what, what he can be. And that's like a true true franchise quarterback like truly he is winning he is pulling the rabbit out of his hat the game against cleveland um a couple of years ago at cleveland is the one that always sticks out in my brain where i truly saw kyler murray take over a game and win from the pocket and then do all the creation stuff too and it's like that's what a healthy and confident kyler is as dynamic as any quarterback in the league and that's why for me it would be hard to move on especially it's always the one in hand two in the bush always kind of thing to me, if I'm betting, like I do think May is a better prospect than even Kyler was, and I think his potential, Drake May. But also, it's like okay, but then the Caleb Williams discussions. It's a, well, you know what? One of the common comparisons Caleb Williams is is like a little bit taller, a little bit slower Kyler Murray. So it's like, like is that worth it? He could be, but he could not be. Like so that's and that's I could like, I could argue it either way. I I, either. I think they hold I, on to him. I would. Like that's what I would do as an outsider, but I can understand the arguments against it. Like if this is it's them and the Bears are just gonna be so fascinating. I know you don't want to talk about the Bears, but they, it's just incredible. We don't. Oh, I think the, I think the Bears' decision isn't that complicated. I, I don't think, think the either. Bears' decision is actually pretty easy. I think this yeah. is a much different consideration with Kyler, but I also think the Kyler is gonna net more in a trade than Justin Fields is going to. 
So that I think should be part of the calculus. If you can get the 15th pick mm-hmm. and Caleb Williams or Kyler Murray, I think you have to think about that. I think fear drives these decisions too often. I think teams fear of the unknown and saying, well, our guy is good enough. We're going to stick with our guy. I think too often that's what teams default to at the quarterback position specifically. But Kyler's more than good enough. Like oh, I agree. I agree with that. I think yeah. he's better. He's better than other guys that teams talk themselves into. This is a slightly different version of the conversation, right. but I still think that anything should be on the table. I don't think oh, yeah. we have Kyler. That's we, we're just rolling with that should be what they default to. I think that they I should think, seriously think, consider every single path. And I think they are. I think they don't know, know what they're doing either. <laughs> like, I, I don't think they do at all. Well, I'm not saying they don't have a plan, but I'm saying that they just right at this moment in time, they're just like, I think they're just letting the chips fall right now. And then they're going to determine it as soon as the season wraps up. There's like you said, there's so many seats at the table, head coaching wise, coordinator wise, quarterback wise. The picks can be moving very quickly. It's going to be. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of action coming up. I think they handled this the right way and they approached it the right way where they looked at him and said, hey, we're going to give this guy every shot. If this works out great because he's a good player. But I don't think they lock themselves into anything, and I don't think they're locked into anything right now. So we'll see how it ultimately shakes out, but yeah. it's going to be a fascinating thing to keep an eye on as we get deeper into the offseason here. Yeah. All right. No fourth screen this week. Weird schedule. Yeah. So I just didn't have a chance to send that email out. But time for Tice's touts, and then we'll yeah. get out of here. One quick update. <laughs> yeah. Wins League's still over. The only reason I want to keep mentioning this and the fact that you've pretty much won it is I don't want people to forget that there is a very big bet riding on this, and we are getting much closer close. to that bet being settled. Very so it, it's we're getting there. Very so close. just ju- just a heads up that you're up by eight. It's probably over. There will be a bet that I have to pay off during Super Bowl week. I don't want that to be a surprise to people when it actually happens. It, you know, it's not uh, why well, I'm not up at eight in is my picks, my touts. I think I'm up one. Yeah, you're over 500 for the year, 24, 100. 23, and 2. And this week I had, did a negative prep, so we're just going to fly by the seat of our pants, and we'll see how it does this week. So join it's me if week you want. between Christmas and New Year's, buddy. Join me if you want, guys. Like This is this is how we're going to do it this week. But sometimes, hey, sometimes you got to spin it like this. Um, I'm going to go with the 49ers minus 13 at the Commanders. I think the Commanders have a lot of well, – Jacoby Brissett, but they have a lot of incentive right now to, you know, just hey, let's keep it down there. Let's keep those picks in the top three. Maybe maybe a little bit lower. Uh, you and you I sounded like Rose Byrne and neighbors. Yeah, let's keep it down. Let's just keep it down. Let's well, keep just, we'll just keep it down. Also, the Niners are pissed. So pissed. I could I could imagine them not being very happy and Shannon. putting it on they're putting it on Washington. Oh yeah, wait till you see this offense performance. I, I think they're gonna have some fun. Uh man, this one, this one I, I can't believe I'm doing, but I am going with the Panthers plus six and a half at the Jags because why not going against a reeling team? Yes. They need a win. What a sad game, right? What a sad game. And it sounds like Trevor Lawrence is going to play the 1995 expansion battle between, you know, the two cat teams. I know Uh, Trevor. Oh my God. Like just seeing his injury report. It's just, just feels feels like the black Knight from Monty Python at this point, just trotting him out a quarterback. That's what this feels like. Yeah. I'll I'll bite your knees off. Uh, but the, uh, uh, I actually, in my mock, I really like this pick. I'm patting myself on the back here. Uh, I gave them Graham Barton, who is an offensive lineman from Duke. He plays tackle, but he is uh, the senior bowl going to be playing center. He can play all, across all five spots. Just just give him a real interior guy. Just like just give him a center that he can work with for the next decade. Give him his Jeff Saturday, but like potentially better. And uh, like give him some of his guards, like some of these kind of guys. Like they they actually need this. So I, I, I that was one that I like really marinated on. I'm like, yeah. I, I, it's, it's funny it's, that for most teams, if you were to give them an interior offensive lineman, I think they'd be like, oh man, that's kind of boring. I think oh, Jags man. fans would be cheering for that right now if you gave them an interior offensive lineman. Do you know who else? They Titans should be. Fans. Titans fans went nuts. I give him Joe Alt from Notre Dame. Titans fans went nuts giving them a left tackle. They were just like, oh, yeah, they're going nuts. Brandon Thorne comes in. He's like, left guard. Look at that left guard and left tackle duo. So some of this, I, I like writing some of this fan fiction. I didn't know that was such a desired pick for them. So that was fun. For the uh, Titans? It better be, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. But that's that, honestly, that is not a bad outcome for no. you to be picking as high as you are over the last couple of years to come away from those and, two drafts with Skaronsky and Joe Alt as like a rebuild when you're trying to build this thing back up. I actually like that a lot. And I prefer Fashanu um, from Penn State, but Alt is still in his tier, which is saying something because I think Fashanu is at a like 
true, true top 10 pick grade. And so was all. So uh, this tackle class is great. So I like that one. I'm trying to think of other ones. Oh, I gave a uh, Cooper DeGene from Iowa to the Vikings. This in my, in my, this multiverse, the Vikings uh, keep Ryan Flores next year. So let's just get this kind of DB that can line up anywhere and play very well. Pro Bowl caliber DB outside, inside, or in the safe at the safety spot. I truly believe that with the Vikings, get him out there and get him running around. So that, that one I liked. And then uh, Bengals fans are very happy about Jarzon Newton from Illinois going to the, uh, going to them defensive tackle. I didn't realize that they were kind of manifesting that one a little bit. Anyways, no, no DJ reader potentially next year. Their defense right. has been a disaster. Different flavor. Yes. Different flavor than they have. Yeah. It creates some pressure up the middle with Hendricks. I kind of, that one was, that was another one. I was like, Oh, I like that. So yeah. Bengals fans like that one a lot. Go. Okay. Last game. Uh, I stalled as much as I could because I'm really just like, do not want to pick some of these games because I just want to enjoy them. But I'm going to go, I'm going to go with the frisky Cardinals plus 10 and a half at the Eagles. Why not? Another bird on bird matchup. Let's do it. Uh, so yeah, let's go with Man, those. There's those some frisky really Cowards. sad shit here that's happening right now. Uh, double you go with one. Panthers, Cardinals. Yep. Uh-huh. Oh my God. Uh, I kind of want to switch that Panthers one. That one just, no, but I, I mean. It's just, I just, their defenses make it mucky. They, they, they just keep it tight. They keep it tight over under that 38. God, that's just, that's just, how about Falcons bears? That's an interesting one. That's what it's yeah. going to be. Yeah. I've, I'm good. trying not to emotionally engage anymore. I'm, I'm just ready for the season to end. <laughs> Week 17, the athletic football show. <laughs> I don't mean in general. Them. I just mean for the bears specifically. Yeah. All right, guys, that's all we got. Sincerely appreciate you listening. One quick note, programming note. Our week 17 recap will be available to you on Monday midday. We are not going to be doing it on New Year's Eve. We're going to be recording it early on New Year's Day. So similar to last week where it's available to you, I don't know, 1 p.m. Eastern, so lunchtime Eastern. I hate this. I I really, really cannot wait for all of the holidays to not be going on when there's a football game, not only because of family time and and wanting to spend time with them, but just the schedule is just a mess. So very excited for New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve to not be on Sundays next year. Very much looking forward to it, but we will have our week 17 preview. It'll just be a little bit later than you typically might expect. So just a heads up on that for now, though, that is all we got. Sincerely appreciate you guys listening. We'll talk to you soon.